we asked the HTS team some of your questions from Twitter. What does HTS stand for? So HDS stands for High Temperature Superconductor. But that term came about when they were discovered because traditionally superconductors only operated at low temperatures and typically most superconductors are operated in liquid helium at 4.2 Kelvin or below and highest temperature superconductor before about 30 years ago was 24 Kelvin, something along those lines. Theoretical physics governed that the highest temperature you could get to was 24 Kelvin. And then someone came along and they found one with a much higher temperature and, and that was a real surprise. So people have taken to calling this material, which is one of many high temperature superconductors, by that name. What we prefer to refer to it as is high field superconductor. And that's because we, we will still operate this conductor at relatively low temperatures, sort of 20, 30, 40 Kelvin. But the benefit that we're getting at those temperatures is the ability to generate massive magnetic field strengths. And that's, that's the real determining quality for us in our intended use. So it's, we, we prefer high field superconductor. It always seems odd to me that people describe these superconductors as ceramic, which I think of as insulators. Does the team have the same sense of wonder and are other common insulating materials also candidates for strange conducting behaviour? Superconductors are extremely strange materials and in particular high temperature superconductors are extremely strange. People don't understand the fundamental electronic mechanisms that make this material work despite the, them being able to produce technological conductors and develop them to a very high level. So there's still a Nobel Prize waiting for whoever figures out the fundamental mechanism by which this material works. It is a ceramic but it, it is actually an ohmic conductor and it, another interesting uh, feature of, of all superconductors is that they tend to be bad conductors in the no what's called the normal state. So if you heat the, the material to just above its superconducting transition temperature and measure its resistivity, that tends to be a relatively high number and that's intrinsically linked to, the, to why it is a superconductor. I have heard that there are problems finding enough supply of HTS material. Is that really a challenge? Has the supply improved in recent years? and are suppliers cooperating? The short answer is yes. The longer answer is uh, the supplier has improved. As a business, Tokamak Energy, we are going through a fairly extensive program of developing the supply chain. So because Fusion is now looking a very promising technology, and because Fusion requires large amounts of high temperature superconductors, the, the, the manufacturers of high temperature superconductors are now very, very interested in scaling up their production. For many, many years, uh, HTS has been an excellent technology waiting for a really killer application. And now Fusion is that application, or, or spherical tokamaks in particular, it, it, it is that application. We're in discussions with the suppliers um, and we're getting extremely favorable responses from those suppliers. They now understand that this is real, it's, it's, it's happening, um, and it's a very good opportunity for them to, to increase their, their business in high temperature superconductors. Which suppliers are you using for your HTS? When do you expect to begin scaling up and placing orders for substantial quantities of HTS? We've already placed substantial orders, so we're, we're, already, we're already taking delivery of high temperature superconductors from a number of suppliers. Um, but those, those commercial relationships must remain confidential. How do the Rebco tapes deal with neutron radiation? Does it influence the flux pinning, quench protection in some way? It's an ongoing study um, and we're working with um, external partners to, to look into these effects. And there's also a body of literature of tapes that have been put into fission reactors and exposed to neutron flux and actually they get better to begin with before they degrade um, as the defects build up too much. So there's every reason to believe that they'll um, survive uh, well enough to build a fusion reactor. HTS magnet testing seems to be ahead of plan. Congrats! How close are you to the field strength you need for a reactor? And when do you hope to run a reactor with these magnets? An ST40 upgrade? Are the MIT team using the same HTS? If not, what's the difference? We've achieved the field strength that we need on tape. We've ticked that box. What we haven't done is demonstrated the field strength from 
uh, a magnet of the right profile as a tokamak magnet, which is what the demo four system uh, will do. Mm. So that will be on test in September next year, September 2020. The challenges are scaling up the stored energy of the magnet. The stored energy of a fusion size magnet is three orders of magnitude more than these. And the other thing that uh, needs to be demonstrated is the forces um, on, the, on the coils. That will be demonstrated in the small scale tokamak that we're going to build. Mm -hmm. We don't intend to put HTS magnets on ST40 and the reason is that in order to maintain speed of development we've separated the development of plasma control from the development of high temperature superconducting magnets, HTS magnets. So we're, we're doing those in parallel and the next time that HTS magnets and active plasma emissions will come together is in 2025 when we build a machine called STF1 and that will be a larger spherical tokamak with HTS magnets and a fusion goal. What are the biggest technical challenges? What are the areas where you're looking for external innovation? And what are the first large-scale applications of fusion energy likely to be? We have a fairly clear roadmap of, of how we need to develop the technology. And we have a fairly clear understanding of the technology readiness levels we have in the various technologies we need to develop. We know where we need to focus our engineering and development resources in order to bring those, those technologies up to the level that we need to, to build working tokamak machines. We're already collaborating with a number of external organisations, most of the leading universities, uh, CERN. We're a small organisation, relatively small organisation. We can't possibly address all of the issues. Um, and, you know, we need external expertise. So, yes, we're, 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 we're already collaborating. Have any life cycle assessments or estimates been done on your fusion process, and particularly water use? It relates to um, how you might call the, the, the blankets. Water is actually quite a good material in the sense that it has a high heat capacity and turns to steam and you can use the steam to drive generators. The problem is if you're doing deuterium-tritium reaction is you don't want tritiated water, which, which is what you end up with. So water is best avoided. Uh, so we, we don't have a plan to use water at the moment. Well, the life cycle assessments, one of the things that re we're reviewing in terms of the design of the STF-1 system is maintenance structures and, and maintenance cycles. In terms of reviewing the design and how you might put that together, maintenance is a big factor in that. <laughs>